really know what cosmology will look like when the dust settles. Possibly eventually someone might find a missing term in the equations, plop that in, and everyone's going to pretend like they knew it all along. It's time for some more Kurtzbazat. Specifically, this is bad, referring to universal expansion rate being off. Well, in nuclear engineering, we deal with calibration drifts all the time. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I'm clenching to everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's see. 12,026 calendar and get it in time for the holidays. Our best theory of the universe could be wrong. Finally, we're going through... Finally. <laughs> He was looking forward to in that. All right, so it's a bit like hearing somebody say, a reactor model doesn't match the temperature readings, finally. Which, if you're looking at it, which operationally could be alarming. In some cases, literally, you can actually get an alarm you have to respond to. But if you're looking at it at, say, the prototype phase or the testing phase, say it's a new type of design that you're just not quite matching, which in science, our model of the universe is far from 100% accurate, then, yeah, this could be where things get interesting. After all, reactors do get safer when the models break and we refine them. And at and astrophysics would get deeper when observations stop matching prediction. Just means we're learning. An incredibly exciting moment. Thanks to amazing new technology, our understanding of the universe is moving faster than it has in years. Right. And if we're fortunate, we could be at the edge of the next revolution in the way we see the cosmos. A moment as exciting as when we first realized that the Earth revolves around the sun, that the stars are other suns, or that our galaxy is just one tiny island in an ocean of trillions. So all looks like improvements in detector technology. I mean, after all, from the early days of telescopes, all you had was the naked eye. So this would be a bit like when digital neutron detectors replaced analog systems. Suddenly you're seeing time-resolved behavior that you could never measure before. Better sensors or better physics. Why do we think this? Because for the first time in ages, the universe is misbehaving badly. Giant apple. Nasty universe. For decades, we've had a beautiful theory of the cosmos. One that explained how the universe began, what it's made of, and... So, mention misbehaving. When a reactor misbehaves, you either fix the model or fix the hardware. Um, we don't have the technology to fix the hardware in the case of the universe. So, only choice is to fix the model. How it's supposed to behave. It matched our observations astonishingly well and made us feel like we'd almost deciphered the cosmic code. But in the last few years, as our telescopes got better and our data sharper, cracks started to appear. Strange mismatches between what the theory predicted and what we actually saw. At first, they looked like silly mistakes, noise that would go away with more data. But as new data came in, the opposite happened. Hmm. Some cracks got larger, new ones emerged, and our once perfect picture of the cosmos began to look less and less perfect. It's a cool of course, dome this wasn't new. Two centuries ago, astronomers noticed that Uranus's orbit didn't quite follow the laws of gravity. But instead of throwing those laws sure. away, they proposed that a dark planet was tugging on Uranus from afar. Shortly after, Neptune was discovered exactly where the math said it would be. But then came Mercury. Its orbit also didn't make sense, so scientists tried the same trick. But this time, no new planet showed up. The answer wasn't more stuff, but a completely new idea. Gravity had to be reimagined, and we invented general relativity, opening a whole new dimension in our understanding of the universe. So in nuclear terms, this is a bit like the transition from the liquid drop model of the nucleus to the shell model, and then suddenly everything starts to make more sense. And what looked like random or erroneous behavior gains structure. You don't get novel thinking unless you stress test the model until it cracks. So are we going through a Uranus moment or a Mercury one? First crack, cosmic monsters. The first signs that something deep could be off began piling up around 15 years ago in the form of a few seemingly impossible cosmic monsters. A giant arc of galaxies over 3 billion light years wide. A massive hmm. group of quasars spanning 4 billion light years. A I have to say, they've really stepped up their animation game with this one. I've always preferred their animations of things in space, but it's... 
Fascinating. A ring of galaxies five billion light years across. A giant ring of gamma ray bursts. <laughs> so in that case, you're literally looking at some radiation detector stuff. An unfathomable wall of galaxies stretching 10 billion light years from end to end, a whopping 10% of the entire observable universe. The list goes on. That's not all. There are also monstrous voids, vast cosmic deserts with far fewer galaxies than normal. And according to some surveys, we happen to be living deep inside one of them, a gargantuan local hole two billion light years across. Mm -hmm. So this is the astrophysics version of discovering unexpected hotspots in a reactor core where the neutron flux is way higher than what the models predicted or way lower in some cases. In reactor physics, if neutrons cluster too much, you can worry about criticality when you're shut down, if you have it clustered when you're shut down, or when you're starting up about taking it critical too soon. But here, if you're getting clusters and holes, then that would challenge the principle that states on large enough scales the universe becomes uniform, which might not be the case. I mean, after all, reactor cores are not perfectly symmetric either. Where's the problem? Well, the universe is organized in ever larger structures, galaxies, galaxy clusters, superclusters, and eventually filaments, truly gargantuan structures separated by equally enormous voids. But our cosmic theory says that these things can't get arbitrarily large. At distances beyond one billion light years or so, the filaments and voids should blur into a uniform soup. Yeah. And this is more cosmological principle. More than a technical detail, it's a basic pillar of all our attempts to make sense of the cosmos itself. Our understanding of the universe rests on one key assumption, the cosmological principle. This is the idea that if you zoom out far enough, the universe should be uniform, looking the same everywhere. This is crucial because it means that our limited view of the cosmos is a fair sample of the whole. That even if we are tiny creatures living in a speck of dust, we can learn things about the entire universe. Both the cosmos itself and our place in it might be more unruly and chaotic than they should be. We could be in a hot spot. Yeah, that's, that's interesting if you view the universe as a really big reactor. But if the cosmological principle turns out to be wrong, we have a huge problem. Because if the universe isn't the same everywhere, we could be like ants trying to guess the flavor of a cake while sitting on its only cherry. Everything we see might just be local weirdness, a cosmic quirk that doesn't tell us the actual story of the universe. Second That's crack, a universe at two speeds. The next crack appeared no, about 10 years ago. There. It tore straight at the fabric of space, challenging how fast it grows. Every second, the universe gets yeah, a little bigger. Will. We know this because we have different ways to measure it and all confirm that space is expanding. The problem, they can't agree on how fast. So to me, this isn't necessarily that different from what you would see in a nuclear power plant. There are several different ways you measure reactor power. You can measure neutron flux via the uh, instruments in the core that measure directly how many neutrons the reactor is making. You can look at um, delta T or the temperature rise in the primary loop, which is correlated to a reactor power level. You can look at a heat balance, uh, a calorimetric, which is based on heat transfer and fluid flow. You can look at the impulse pressure of the main turbine, because that also follows reactor power. And as far as which one's the most accurate, that really depends where you are at in power and what the reactor is doing. If you're at steady state 100% power, like most reactors are, then the most accurate one is going to be the calorimetric, the heat balance. But if you're moving the reactor where f um, fluid flow changes, then what becomes more accurate is the, uh, the delta T, the primary loop temperature rise, because that's what you see first when you are uh, raising or lowering reactor power. And when you're low in power, say the main turbine's not even online yet, then the nuclear instruments are probably going to be more, then the nuclear instruments are going to be more accurate. They're going to be less saturated. And if things are off, well, you recalibrate. There are power plateaus when raising or lowering power where you have technicians come and uh, 
do calibrations for all of your nuclear instrumentation. You also just remeasure. You run independent diagnostics. So if you're getting two very different numbers for universal expansion, then yeah, the model's probably wrong. It's like measuring the speed of a car using two devices and getting different results. You read 67 on the speedometer, but 73 on the GPS. One of the instruments must be broken, right? But then you check them again and again and again. I was going to say, yeah, not, not necessarily. Though, if one of them is broken, which one is broken? That, that can get pretty hard. And both work flawlessly. This is very much what happens with the universe. The details are messy and complicated, but they don't matter for this story. The important part is that, as measurements and calculations have become more and more precise, the disagreement has only become worse. By now, the chance that this mismatch is just an accidental fluke is less than one in a million. Mm. The universe is literally giving us two different answers to the same question. So, something fundamental must be broken. Either our measurements of the universe or our basic understanding of it. Third crack, old galaxies in a baby universe. The latest surprise is only about three years old. It shattered a key part of our cosmic timeline, how and when the first galaxies formed. Telescopes act like time machines. Light from distant galaxies takes so long to reach us that we don't see them as they are now, but as they were in the past. In 2021, we launched the James Webb, the most powerful space telescope ever built. And almost immediately, it began finding bright, massive galaxies so distant that they belonged to a time when the universe was extremely young. The problem? Some are so premature that they date back to 280 million years after the Big Bang, far earlier than anyone expected. Our theory says that the amorphous soup of matter that emerged from the Big Bang gave rise to the first galaxies through a long chain of mergers. Yeah. Tiny lumps of dark and normal About matter gathered million. under gravity, building larger chunks that then fused into even bigger ones, and so on. But this process is lengthy. By in other words, nuclear fusion's been around for a very long time in space, whereas here it's always 20 years out. <laughs> Our best estimates, the first large galaxies should have emerged 500 million years after the Big Bang or so, not much before. But it isn't only that we found large galaxies existing way before that. The new galaxies also seem to be too mature. Matter in the baby universe was made up almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. Heavy elements like carbon or nitrogen were only forged later in the cores of stars, yeah. which had to explode to release them. But some of these super early galaxies contain a lot of heavy elements, meaning that in time... That's cool that we could measure what's in them from back then. That's just fascinating to me. Anyway, this is the equivalent of seeing a fission product Xenon-135 build up before the reactor even starts, or detecting plutonium in a fresh fuel rod. Because after all, plutonium isn't used directly in brand new fuel, but... It is breeded during a typical fuel cycle to the point where even a basic vanilla pressurized water reactor towards the end of life, as much as 30% of the fissions could be from plutonium-239 because the uranium-238 can absorb a neutron, become uranium-239, and then a couple of beta decays later, you get plutonium-239, which is also thistle, just like uranium-235. In fact, it actually gives a bit more energy. So what that means operationally is towards the end of core life, um, the reactor actually becomes a bit more sensitive, just something to be aware of. But yeah, this would be the equivalent of seeing, of having a higher burn up in a fresh core cycle and seeing things that you're just not supposed to see yet. Fascinating. In other words, like finding a spent fuel rod in a brand new reactor core. What, or what you thought was a brand new reactor core. Our generations of stars must have lived and died even before them. So this is like finding grown-up kids in a kindergarten. Either the first galaxies sprouted in fast forwards, or we're missing something huge about the infancy of the universe. Hmm. From cracks to crisis. These problems aren't the only ones. Our theory also says that the Big Bang should have created three times more lithium than we see out there, a decades-old edge that astronomers just can't scratch. It predicts that dark matter should pile up sharply at galaxy centers, but instead we find gentle hills. It says that dark energy, the mysterious force pushing the universe apart, has stayed constant since the Big Bang. All right, so these are all just the equivalent of anomalies detected during a reactor startup. I mean, I guess you could say the Big Bang's a bit like a universal reactor startup. But yeah, 
He likes seeing coolant temperature mismatch, control rod worth being off by 20%, which is ridiculously high, and asymmetrical flux shape. And yeah, if you start seeing enough of these, then I can see how that can lead you to question the model. But last year, one of the biggest galaxy surveys ever conducted dropped the bombshell that it may have been changing over time. If true, this would overturn our current picture of the universe, its past, and its future. Mm. Even things that we considered settled beyond any doubt, like the interpretation of the cosmic microwave background, are suddenly up for debate. Those Ooh. early galaxies might have been bright enough to contaminate the signal. These are Yeah, that's interesting, because this is the startup physics test of the universe. Basically the true benchmark measurement. And... If early galaxies were bright enough to affect it, then yeah, this is the equivalent of discovering that the neutron flux mapping was skewed because someone put the detectors in the wrong spots. Or possibly you have a reactor within your reactor that's throwing things off. Fascinating. Bold claims that require much more evidence, but the mere fact that such fundamental pillars are being discussed is staggering. So, okay, what does all this mean? Right now, there are furious battles going on. Some scientists argue that these aren't real cracks, but mirages that will disappear with time, or raw gems that will end up refining our theories. Others are more radical and say we need completely new ideas. But whatever the case, the big picture is difficult to ignore. The sense of crisis is growing. And for the first time in ages, we don't really know what cosmology will look like when the dust settles. Which I mean, in nuclear engineering, conservative engineers say fix the measurement and the more theoretical out there ones would say fix the model. Um, possibly eventually someone might find a missing term in the equations, plop that in and everyone's going to pretend like they knew it all along. <laughs> We've seen that with uh, the discovery of the neutrino, for instance. But yeah, if it's stuff we don't know yet and stuff we don't know yet. It's amazing because in science, crisis doesn't mean failure. It means that the machine is healthy and working. The science, the machine being the scientific method, not the model. <laughs> doesn't move in a straight line, but in cycles, periods of calm followed by sudden crises. When a crisis hits, experiments start giving results that don't fit existing theories. Confusion grows and strange ideas pop up. And eventually there is a revolution. A deeper truth emerges and a new cycle starts over again. The universe is screaming that our story is incomplete. Whether we'll find a cosmic Neptune or a cosmic Mercury, one thing is certain, the cosmos is about to get a lot more interesting. I mean, every leap in nuclear science had the same thing, whether it be the discovery of the neutron, the realization that fission was happening, finding out that xenon or a fission product can slow down your nuclear reactions, and all the surprises that are being seen with plasma confinement and fusion. I mean, everything gave better models and ultimately better technology. But yeah, this is a sign that the reactor being the universe is still running safely as far as we can tell. But the model is clearly missing physics. But just like reactor codes get new cross-section libraries, the universe could be heading towards, I don't know, modified gravity, revised early universe physics, or something completely new. Interesting stuff. Thanks so much for the recommendation, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.